of Jesus' ministry here on earth. And especially over the last several weeks, we've been looking at what happened after the resurrection. We're looking at the very first chapter of Acts this week about what happened then. It's kind of a conclusion to all that. So let me read. I'll read verses 1 through 14 to give us some background. You don't need to read along out loud, but you may uh, pick up a Bible if you want to read along. You can read along on the screen or, or on your smartphone device. There's a link at the bottom of the bulletin. You can type in if you don't have a Bible app already. But this is Acts uh, verse one, chapter 1, verse 1 through verse 14. The author Luke tells us, In the first book, O Theophilus, referring to the Gospel of Luke, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up. After he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen, he presented himself alive to them after his sufferings by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they'd come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It's not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the very ends of the earth. And when he said these things, as they were looking up, he was lifted up. And a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot and Judas the son of James. All these were with one accord, were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and his brothers. This is the word of the Lord. Well, there's been a lot of news going on lately, so uh, dizzying and all the reports that are coming out about various scandals and things uh, right now be. But one story you may have missed is the ongoing struggles that are taking place in Puerto Rico in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria. Uh, Just this Wednesday, just a few days ago now, reports came out that there was another major power outage on the island that hit. And one of the reports said this, the Electric Power Authority and its dispatch crews sent dispatch crews to investigate why a key 230 kilovolt line that connected the island's northern and southern regions had failed for the second time in a week. The failure caused the U.S. territory power generation in Puerto Rico to drop to 22% of functioning power. The Army Corps of Engineers that is there and other relief agencies that are working to help rebuild the infrastructure uh, with the local government essentially know exactly the steps that they need to take to help rebuild the island and get things back in order and get all the aid they have out to those who are suffering and to begin rebuilding Puerto Rico. But without significant power, their efforts are sadly being stalled or even stopped completely when these power outages keep happening. It's a good reminder for us to continue praying for uh, that island and for those Americans that are going through that and ask that, that God would give grace to those seeking to get power back online and aid those who are suffering. But the Lord Jesus, in his time on earth, had instructed and demonstrated everything his disciples were to do, right? He spent three years personally training them, showing them all they were called to do once he departed. But even after Jesus' resurrection, we see the disciples were largely unchanged. They did not lack knowledge 
or training in what to do, they lacked power in how to do it. Today in Acts 1, the risen Jesus ascends back to the Father. This is what Christians call the ascension. And so went whoop, right back up to heaven with the Father. But before he does that, he makes clear power is coming. So here's the key takeaway today. Again, it's on the back of your bulletin, and it's right up there here. Key takeaway today, when the risen Jesus ascended to his Father, he promised us power through the Holy Spirit to tell the good news to the whole world. He promised us power through the Holy Spirit. So, let's take a look at that. Like I said last week, you know, anytime we come into a new book, so we're jumping into, uh, we've closed off the Gospels essentially, and we're jumping into the book of Acts. Usually when we do that, we try to give you some good background. We try to give you, here's the context of why this book was written. Here's who the author was and why he specifically wrote. We'll get into that later. Over the next couple weeks, we're going to get into uh, our Advent season. We'll look a little bit at Acts. We'll focus on some of the Christmas themes and things uh, together, and then on the uh, 17th, we'll have a specific Christmas message before our Christmas candlelight service on Christmas Eve, which is one of my favorite uh, services of the year, and if you've been here before, uh, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, so in January, we'll pick back up in uh, the book of Acts, and we'll kind of do that background activity then, uh, but for the sake of time, really, this first chapter of Acts almost uh, acts and serves as a conclusion to the gospel. So it's almost kind of a, the ending point, even though it's the starting of a new book. So we'll get some more context on it later. But Luke is the author. He's the same guy who wrote the Gospel of Luke. Uh, Acts is essentially like part two if the Gospel of Luke is part one. They kind of put uh, together, if you will. In fact, many people study them that way. So here he picks up. And Luke starts to give us a little bit of background into what has taken place up to this point. He says he was writing about, in the Gospel of Luke, all that Jesus began to do and to teach. Then he recaps the resurrection accounts, uh, where Jesus, he says, presented himself alive to his disciples many times. And we learn that he detailed that he didn't do it just once or twice. He actually did it over a period of 40 days. So it's very significant that he appeared that many times. And then we get to verses 4 and 5, which we'll primarily look at here today. And in those verses, we get a flashback probably to one of these moments that Jesus taught things about the Holy Spirit. So Jesus emphasizes a promise that when he leaves will happen. Here's what he says. He says, John baptized you with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Not many days from now. Now, uh, most likely, if you've been to churches at all, if you've grown up at all uh, in a church, or even if you're new, you may be familiar with what baptism is. And we usually think of baptism as that thing we do when you take someone and you dunk them into a tank of water or a pool or somewhere in the ocean, and you bring them back up and people clap and cheer because it's a significant moment in someone's life. Or in other traditions, you may have grown up in places where uh, infants are sprinkled with water as a way to baptize because, again... You don't want to dump children. Bad things happen when that happens, so you sprinkle little kids. So you may think of baptism in those ways or in your own tradition. That is not what Jesus is primarily talking about here, the thing we do as a church as a sign of someone coming to put their faith in Jesus. Jesus is talking about something differently. Essentially here, he mentions John the Baptist, who came a lot uh, earlier before this in the first parts of the Gospels. And Jesus says this, when John was dunking people in the Jordan River, he essentially was preparing people for my coming, Jesus says. It was to get people spiritually ready for the work of Jesus that he was coming to do. But now Jesus essentially says, something completely different is going to happen. Something completely new. The word for baptism literally means, in Greek, it means immersed. It means fully surrounded by, it means fully covered by. Uh, My old uh, uh, mentor back in college used to have an illustration he used. I didn't do it here this morning, but he took a little R2-D2 and he said, this little R2-D2 figure is you, Kristen. And then he took some Dr. Pepper, he poured it in a big cup, and then he dropped in R2-D2 into the cup and said, 
This is what it's like to be immersed, to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. You're covered, you're surrounded, you are hidden in Christ and what He's done uh, for you. So to be immersed means to be fully covered. So, then what is Jesus literally saying here when He says you'll be baptized by the Holy Spirit? Essentially something like this. He says, look, John's work was to immerse and surround you with water. But that's all it was. It was water. It had no power to change you. It had no power to ultimately help you. And now what I'm promising a few days from now is completely different. I'm not going to immerse you with some earthly element like water, some common thing. I'm going to immerse you in the very spirit of the living God. Do so you see how powerful that promise is. John's baptism was all symbolic. It had no power in and of itself. But Jesus says he's going to baptize all his disciples, including you if you've put your faith in Jesus today or at any time in the past. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit of God. So if all that's true, if that's the case for you and for me today, if you're a follower of Jesus, then we need to ask, who is the Holy Spirit? Because what does that mean for our lives today? Well, if you were here last week, you remember I introduced the message with an illustration uh, from Star Wars, because I'm that much of a geek, uh, and I said the key line is one of the parts of that was, use the fullest, Luke, if you remember it all. That's probably one of the best ways we can start off saying who the Holy Spirit isn't. He is not a force, Luke. <laughs> So many of us, probably for good reason, when we think of spirits, we think of some kind of like fog that kind of goes around. Maybe we think of like a ghost in our heads, kind of going in and out of walls, and those are the things that pop in. And it probably uh, doesn't primarily help us that the old King James Version, which was a translation made about 500 years ago or so, uh, 400, 500, give or take, 100 years. That version says Holy Ghost instead of Holy Spirit. It translates the word spirit in, that we translate into ghost, and so you hear Holy Ghost sometimes. Different churches uh, talk about it that way still. So it doesn't kind of help us that we might think of a spirit as kind of a, a ghost or something that you know, floats around and is mysterious and things like that. But that's not primarily what the Holy Spirit, who the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit, in the rest of Scripture, is made, makes it clear that the Holy Spirit is a person. He is a person. He's not just a person, but He's actually God as well. One God and three persons. This gets a little complex. Go with me now and make your brain hurt just a little bit. But if we're going to know who God is, we need to know how He reveals Himself. When we think of God, we think of one God and three persons. Not... One God with two persons and an impersonal force on the side. Within God, there is one and only one God. And within that one and only one God, there's the person of the Father. And the person of the Father, the Father has a will. He has desires. He has love that he feels towards people and towards creation. He has actions and things that he does, etc., on and on. Within God, there is the person of the Son. There is Jesus. And Jesus has a will. He has desires. You get to see this clearly, right? When we walk through the Gospels, you see all sorts of things that Jesus thinks, feels, does, loves, moves, has compassion, etc., etc. So, if the Holy Spirit is also a person, guess what the Holy Spirit has? He has a will. He has desires. He has love. He has actions. And so on and so on. Just like the other two persons of the triune God. The Holy Spirit is a person. Jesus consistently referred to him as such. But he's not just a person. He is also God. He is not just a part of God or a kind of compartment of God. He is fully God in the same way that the Father is fully God. God. The Son is also, Jesus is fully God, not a part of God. The Holy Spirit then also is fully God. So if we're to know Him, 
we're to know what he is like, that he's a person, that he's also fully God. So here are two big errors that people can make, that churches sometimes can make in regards to the Holy Spirit. First, one way is to minimize his role, to downplay who he is. He becomes kind of a forgotten member of the Trinity. He becomes the red-headed stepchild of the Trinity. I'm sorry if you were red. Poor red-headed stepchildren. Well, how did that become a thing that's derogatory? So if, you're, if, you, if you have red hair and you were, you were a stepchild, I'm sorry. I should not say that, that offensive thing. But that the Holy Spirit becomes that. We just kind of go, we know God the Father. He's big. He's God. You know, he sent Jesus. He's probably, you know, we think of him as God proper. We know Jesus. He came to earth. He died on the cross. He lived. He healed. He showed people his love. He talked to people individually. He rose from the dead. He gave his life. He's our Savior. He's forgiven our sin through his death and resurrection. But then the Holy Spirit's like, who, who is that? Where, where does he come in? Is he like floating around somewhere? Is he uh, like up there in the sky? Like what is going on? We can forget who he is. And a lot of times we can act as if he is an impersonal force like, uh, like the force in Star Wars. So that's one end. We can minimize his role or just forget who he really is. The other way is to lift him up way too much beyond who he is really described as. So... That happens when, it is, sometimes in places where that happens, uh, it can seem as if it's not Christianity we are a part of, but Holy spirit Christianity. There are churches sometimes where the Holy Spirit is everything. Seeking out to live in His power, to feel His, His strength, to live out certain miraculous gifts becomes everything. You see some of these uh, uh, places on TV where people, I'd say, are false teachers of the gospel and they do all sorts of crazy things where even some of them have been exposed as complete fakes as well, but powerful healings where they say, in the name of the Holy Ghost, get out, you know, things like that. That is one of the other ways that the Holy Spirit can totally be taken out of context. We can minimize him so he's almost forgotten, or we can raise him up to a place that the scripture doesn't intend him to ever be. The true role of the Holy Spirit is to point people to Jesus. Jesus said as much. He said, when he comes, he will remind you of all that I've said and done. So we must know who the Holy Spirit is if we're going to know who God is. Jesus promised we would be immersed in Him. We'd be filled with Him. We'd be empowered by Him. We'll see this more as we keep going on in Acts as we get into some of the letters of Paul, be able to explore more of how the Holy Spirit works. But for now, the Scripture says, if you've put your faith in Jesus, you are sealed in the Holy Spirit, meaning He comes inside us, He comes inside our hearts, He comes inside our souls, He comes inside our minds, our bodies, and He promises He will never, ever leave us. So, if the Holy Spirit's a person, and if He is fully God, do you know what that means for you, if you put your trust in Him? It means that God is always with you everywhere you go. It means that God is personally with you. If the Holy Spirit's just some kind of force that, you know, surrounds your body as like a fog or something, and it's like, yeah, he's with you, but it's it's a fog. No, no one gets, you know, you might get excited when you see fog, but you don't love fog like you love a person, right? You don't like, oh, fog, I'd like to marry you. That'd be very strange. The Holy Spirit is a person, so it means God is personally with you. Everywhere you go. When you wake up, God is with you personally. When you go to work, God is with you personally. When you're in your car, God is with you personally. Even in traffic. Isn't that amazing? God is there. How can God be on the 405? We would think, but He is there with you. When you go out to dinner, when you lay your head down on the pillow at night, God is always with you intimately and personally because of the Holy Spirit in your life. He is always leading you. He is always guiding you. He is convicting you of your sin and telling you that's not what God wants. And He always promises to change you. 
If the Holy Spirit is a person and he's fully God, it means God is always with you. In fact, some people say Acts, usually Acts is called that because it's thought of as the Acts of the Apostles. Some people think it should be called Acts of the Holy Spirit because we're going to see in this whole book how the Holy Spirit takes a prominent place in using and empowering God's people as they proclaim Jesus. So this is a new promise that Jesus is making here to his disciples and to you and me today. Look, the old way to know God essentially meant reading his scripture like we do today. It meant doing physical sacrifices of actual animals in some places for some times. And it meant essentially, in a way, trying to change in your own power, trying to obey God in your own strength and power. But God was always outside of you, never near to you. He was always in that temple far away where only the holiest of people could go. And now Jesus says, it's totally different. God is now coming to you to live in you. You are now a temple of the Holy Spirit. And he promises he'll never separate himself from you because of the Holy Spirit. This is a new way of God. It's now the new permanent way that God acts towards his people. It's God come inside of us to personally change our hearts, personally guide us, personally make promises to never leave, all because of the Holy Spirit. But now we must ask, Jesus here says you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes. So we got to ask, power for, for what? What is that power for? We have a new personal presence of the God of the universe in our lives. But what is he there for? Why is he given to us? That's where the rest of Jesus' words come in here. Luke takes us right away up into that moment in the next verses. And then in verses 8 and 9, it becomes really clear. But before that, the disciples again continuing the theme of not quite getting exactly what Jesus was here to do. Uh, they say before that, they asked Jesus, Lord, is this the time you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Essentially, if you've been with us this whole time, this may uh, make a little more sense, but if you're not, essentially the disciples are asking, uh, Jesus, is this when all the promises of the forever peace for the people of God are going to come? Is it going to come now? Are you going to liberate us from all our enemies and we're finally going to live in peace forever with you in your new kingdom? Jesus is about to turn their focus away from themselves away from their own peace, away from their own conquering and their own kingdom. And he's about to show them, this is, guys, this is not about peace for just the nation of Israel. This is about peace for every nation in the world. Indeed, this is about peace for every heart in the world. That's where verse 8 comes in. And now it becomes clear what that promised power of the Holy Spirit is ultimately for. This is what Jesus says. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my, what? Witnesses. In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the end of the earth. So what, according to Jesus, before he goes right back up and ascends back to the Father, what is the primary purpose of him sending the Holy Spirit? What is the power of God given to us for Jesus says to be his witnesses. The Holy Spirit is in your life if you've trusted him, if you follow him. One of the primary, ultimate reasons is to be near you, to be personal to you, for you to sense the love of God so that you would be able to tell other people about him. The Holy Spirit's not given to us primarily, Jesus says here, so we can have a really great personal worship experience ourselves, even though that's great. So many people connect with God through singing songs. That's why we do it. We read the Bible because God speaks to us personally through it. We talk about it. We uh, you know, do it in our small groups and community groups and things. But the primary purpose is not that we would be like, oh, this is amazing, and we would have our own personal experience that's amazing with God. 
He didn't primarily come so we could see miraculous things happen, even though we're going to see lots of miraculous things happen in the book of Acts. And even today, we believe God can do the miraculous through the Holy Spirit in our lives. But that's not the primary reason that He's come into our life. The reason the Holy Spirit is here in your life, the reason He gives you power is so that you would be His witnesses to the world. So that you would show the world, here is who Jesus is and what He's like. What's the best news that you've heard lately? Think about that. It might, it might be hard because sometimes watching the news now is really depressing. But what's, let's, let's keep it in the positive. What's some of the best news you've heard lately? I'm, this isn't necessarily something I've heard, but it's something that's a reality. I'm super excited that we are really close to the best holidays of the year. I love Christmas time. I love Thanksgiving. I love the food. I love, after that, we're already, we bought our Groupon to get our, uh, we get a Christmas tree down on Hollywood and Highland. That there's like a lot they put there. It's awesome. It's like, we're in LA and we're getting a Christmas tree. It's really fun. It's a new tradition for us. So we're going we're gonna to decorate. We're going to start playing songs. I'm going to have lots more fattening drinks at Starbucks. Gingerbread latte is the bomb. Uh, and all of those things. I love this time of year. So the news for me that I'm excited about is that the month-long celebration of Advent and Christmas is just about here as well as Thanksgiving. But think about news that's uh, even more life-changing than a fun season that we get to celebrate. Think about, you know, what if the L.A. Times tomorrow published a feature that said, researchers have finally cracked it. We found the cure to cancer. The scientists are working on it. They're, they're going to work with the FDA, and they're going to get out that cure to everyone. That would be news if you read it. That would be news you'd want to tell everyone. Maybe you know someone right now that is suffering from cancer. It would be news that we should spread far and wide. It probably wouldn't take long. We're in the age of Twitter uh, and things and, and uh, social media. But that would be news that you would say, did you hear? Did you hear the amazing news? We found a cure. Isn't this amazing? Isn't this incredible? The news of Jesus coming. The news of Jesus living a sinless life. The only perfect one. The only one who never caved to self-righteousness. The only one who truly ever respected women as we're supposed to. The only one who loved us to the very end. The only one who perfectly obeyed God. Died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin. No matter what it is. Indeed, with enough power and greatness to cover the sin of everyone in the whole world. He came to adopt us into God's family, to make us sons and daughters of the God of the universe. He came to promise He would never, ever leave us. That it was no longer up to us to get our acts together morally and spiritually. That He came to bring that full forgiveness for us and to raise from the dead, to conquer death, to say death will not be the end. Jesus will win. We will live forever as He rights all wrongs, all abuses, ends all oppression forever and ever. He has come. That news is better than any news that could ever be told in the whole world. It's truly news then that must be told to everyone. That we should not hold back for anyone. That is the reason that God has given us the Holy Spirit. Is what Jesus says here. That is the reason God has empowered us. The power of God. The God of the universe. The power that with His little flick of His finger created the entire universe just by speaking it out. That power is given to you and to me so that you can tell the people that wonderful news. The Holy Spirit is personal. The Holy Spirit is fully God. And He lives inside of you to give you the power to tell other people about Jesus. Through your words and through your actions. Are you aware that power is inside of you? 
Are you aware God is always with you everywhere you go? Now, sometimes if you really think about that, that's a little scary. Like, hmm. I know times when I'm not very godly, <laughs> and yet He's still there with you, loving you, calling you to Himself and how to live. So if God's always with you, if He's given you power to be His witness, ask Him for opportunities to do that. In your normal life, with your children, if you are a parent. At Starbucks, if you go to frequent a place, at your favorite restaurant, in your workplace, God, ask me, help me today to be your witness. Give me opportunities through my actions and through my words to tell people the good news. That is one of the most simple, practical things you could do from this. You promise, God, you have given me power to be your witness. Help me to do that today, wherever I go. Well, the whole section ends with another amazing uh, encouragement and promise that Jesus gives to us about what will happen when he gives us the Holy Spirit. The promise is that power will come to his disciples in a bit when the Holy Spirit comes. Next week we'll see when that happens and all the wild stuff that comes as a result. And they will be his witnesses. But we got to ask witnesses to whom? Who are they going to tell? And Jesus essentially says, everywhere. <laughs> he says, and he gives it, makes it very specifically, in Judea, Samaria, and Jerusalem starting there, and then to the very ends of the earth. Uh, Judea was essentially the whole region around Jerusalem, the southern region of Israel, so the most nearby area. We could probably think of Judea in our own kind of mindset as greater southern California. Right? So we, whatever you define as Southern California, going down to San Diego, go, you know, we stop Bakersfield, not Southern California. So before you get over the grapevine uh, there, that is our Judea. Samaria was the northern region above Judea. It was ethnically different because it was a mix of uh, uh, other religions and other ethnicities with uh, Jews at some point. So they were ethnically different. They were religiously different, and they were considered outcasts. So for us, if we were, they had different traditions and things, and even a different uh, set of scriptures that they adhered to. So for us, perhaps, if you think of people different culturally, we could include Canada and Mexico, perhaps, in our own uh, differences, even though we're close neighbors. So maybe the rest of North America would be a good way to sum up uh, Samaria and the other areas Jesus mentions here. So, if, if, if uh, uh, Jesus happened to be here in 2017, he came and did all his stuff, his ministry here in L.A. in 2017, and then he's going to do the same thing for us here. He takes series with Anthology Church. We're more than 12 here, but, you know, he's taken up the disciples, and he takes us up Run in Canyon. Right? We start going up. He's going to go up to a hill. He takes us up. We're overlooking all of Los Angeles. You can see the Hollywood sign off to the left. Whatever. We can see downtown. We can get up. You know, there's no, hopefully no smog uh, this day when Jesus takes us up there. And he's about to ascend. He's going to ascend up on top of the Hollywood hills, and he's going to go, uh, go away. A lot of people think Jesus already left Hollywood. But anyway, that's a whole other matter. So he's with us. He's there. He might say to us, guys, wait here in Studio City. Wait, because I'm going to send the Holy Spirit right there in the middle of Studio City Recreation Center. <laughs> Go hang out there, and I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. He's going to come to you, and when he does, you'll receive power to be my witnesses. And after that, you're going to go tell everyone. You're going to tell everyone in Los Angeles. You're going to tell everyone in all of Southern California. You're going to tell every people group and ethnicity in the United States. You're going to tell everyone in Mexico. You're going to go to Canada. You're going to go to Colombia. You're going to go to Paraguay. You're going to go to Brazil, to Chile. You're going to go to the Caribbean on some ships and things. You're going to go off to the UK. You're going to go to Germany. You're going to go to Russia, to Ghana, to China, to India, to Pakistan, to the Sudan, to Egypt, to Libya, to Nigeria, to Holland, to France, to Japan. Mongolia, I said Japan twice, to the Philippines, to Indonesia, to Burma, to Saudi Arabia, you're going to go to Israel, and even to the deepest and most unknown parts of the jungle and the Amazon, and every most remote part of the deserts in the world where you wouldn't even believe people are there, you're going to go everywhere to the ends of the earth. Christianity essentially is not a 
Western religion primarily does not have its roots in that tradition as if it was meant to stay in the United States of America or in Europe even, in our own communities. Christianity was born out of the Middle East, intended from day one to be for every person and every culture, no matter the ethnic, the linguistic, or the spiritual differences anywhere in the world. Jesus told us as much right here. And by the grace of God, that good news traveled from this hill in Jerusalem through lots of people, through lots of generations across the world to reach you in Studio City here today or wherever you first heard about Jesus. Because enough people looked at the power and the grace of God given through the Holy Spirit and they opened their mouths and they told people the good news. How will you continue that legacy in your life today? How will you, even this week, <laughs> this is John's thing, we're going to go be back with our families this week, right? And families are families. And sometimes it's great, and sometimes it's crazy, right? But you have an opportunity this week to your family to be a witness, to ask God, Lord, give me the power you have promised you've already given me. Help me in whatever way I can through my actions and my words to be your witness to my family this week. How can you carry on that legacy and everywhere else you go in your world? If you haven't put your faith in Jesus, if you haven't trusted Him, this good news about God coming and saving, not based on how good we are, but based on how good Jesus is, can be yours today. The personal God can be yours today. And Jesus promises, when you do that, that personal God will come into your life. He will begin to change your heart. He'll begin to show you things. You go, ooh, I didn't know that was that dark in there. He'll begin to show you His love. He'll transform you by His grace. And then He'll tell you, now go tell others that great news. Let's pray. But thank you that we have uh, such a beautiful portrayal here of Jesus empowering his disciples. We today are his disciples if we put our trust in him. And Lord, you make promises that you have given us the very third person of the Trinity into our hearts, into our minds, into our lives to know intimately your love, not to change in our own power, not to try to obey in our own power as if we are strong enough, good enough to do it on our own, but to transform and to trust you by the power of the Holy Spirit, knowing your love, pointing us to Jesus and what he's done. And then you say you've given us power to go be witnesses to the world. Lord, help us to see ways we've done that. Help us to realize the power that you promised is ours. And we're going to have the chance, Lord, to look through the book of Acts and see some really amazing power going forth because of the Spirit. Lord, help us understand that is the very same Spirit that lives inside of us today. Help us to live that out with our families this week and Thanksgiving. Help us to live that out wherever you called us to be. We praise in Jesus' name. Amen.